All right. All right. Do you sure? You sure you want a podcast like Hold this? Hold on. This is only four feet. Wow. Well, like over here. I figure this rod's seven. This is a butt. This is. But you got to add the butt. Right. All right. Okay. I'll podcast with you. This is. I don't have. I don't have my glasses. Glasses. On, this is six feet. I think that's this. This is six feet. You good? I'm good. Now you stay. Are you ready? How do you want to start this? Well, I mean, I'll podcast with you, but I'm not doing shit till I certify you're a cooler. Okay. But just keep your distance, dude. All right, I'll be back here. I don't want anybody thinking that we're not practicing the social distance thing. But how the frick do you have a cooler in your office? You don't even have a certified cooler. I get, I get, I brought this here too for you to run that dog. You get some dog biscuits for you in case you get hungry. Well. I'm just not going to let you go another day without having a certified cooler. If you had a bucket in here, I'd certify that before that. But since it's a nice cooler, dude, but it's either you certify it or you don't. You can't go through life without a certified there you go. cooler. Thanks, Jeff. Congratulations. <laughs> We are back, in fact. I want to introduce Mahi to everybody. Mahi's Jenny's new dog, and he's a little, he's a little crazy. How old is he? Three months. Three months old. Welcome to the world, Mahi. I'm sorry it's not a, a more sane place than <laughs> it is right now, but you seem to be not sane, so right, you're a good boy. <laughs> you're a good boy. Okay, I know. You love the world. So, all right, go ahead. Go with Mahi. Yeah. Go on, bud. Yeah. We'll see you later. That's going to be a good one. Mahi. There you go. He's already eating the studio. All the panels are all over the floor. So. <laughs> all right, cool. So, I missed this so much. We're back. <laughs> I'm gonna right? Close this John, I, I never thought I'd, I'd say this, but I, I missed seeing your ugly mug. <laughs> <laughs> Same to you, bud. So you guys, so, you guys shut it down. Tall. Yeah, we shut tall. it down. Well, because the thing is, is in the studio, it's a community building. Right. So, you know, when this thing first started kind of happening, everyone was like, what's going on? We didn't really know, and all these crazy stories were coming out. And I was like, talking to, like, the designers and Jenny, I'm like, eh, you guys should probably go home. And yeah. that was the Friday the 13th. Right. Right, and it was like that weekend right after the Jimmy Johnson. And we all kind of feel like, well, we got out of the Jimmy Johnson and nothing happened to anybody and let's not push it. So we all kind of like shut it down for a little bit. Yeah. We can really technically work this business from home. Right. And, but not with the podcast and all the other stuff, obviously, but we've ironically been like busier than ever, <laughs> which is, which is kind of, so trying to do it from home. And so a couple of weeks ago, we were like, we got to get back in the studio and get back to like some sort of normalcy here. So, but it feels really really good to be back I and bet. you know i miss this place a lot you know and i missed having like people in on the show and um you know i we were talking and i could not think of a better person to kind of kick things back into normal within you so i'm so happy that you agreed to come on the show and we're going to drink some beer and we're going to hang out and we're going to do that kind of stuff that we haven't been able to do nice. in the past couple of weeks. So let me crack one. You want to crack one open? I got a couple open to share for you. Nice. Yeah. Some Floridians. I like, uh, favorite, oh, favorite new pastime. That audio came through nice. Favorite new pastime. This has been. I've cheers. Been, yeah. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Awesome. Awesome to be here. And then, especially since I got a cold beer waiting for me. So we are here um, with the Lunker Dog. Jeff Maggio. So, and I don't think I introduced you properly before. So, all good. Thank you very much for coming in. There's a couple of things I want to mention before we start getting into it. I got a feeling we are going to get into it today. <laughs> pretty, pretty good chance. Um, so, I just want to offer a uh, momentary um, shout out and moment of silence, maybe you can call it, for um, Coach Don Shula, okay. who was probably, I would have to say, South Florida's greatest citizen. And uh, we lost him last week and um was it 90 91 yeah something like that and um really you know he is the um 
think Jason Taylor was the one I think had really the best post about it, where he is the standard of what it means to be a Miami Dolphin. Right. And everyone has to try to live up to what the example that he kind of laid out. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but um, that, I think the way Jason Taylor kind of laid it out was really perfect because it's, it really epitomized like what Don Shula was and what he was all about. So he was the standard. He is, you know, what everyone sure. would try to strive through. So I just wanted to say that, you know, Don Shula, he's a guy that we all grew up with here as the, as the Dolphins coach. And Yeah. You know, there you go. Legend. My yeah. birthday buddy, too. We shared the same birthday. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, kind of cool. Can you imagine? I mean, it's hard to imagine South Florida without him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, fifty-two years old. Yeah. Like, never, and you know, thought once that Miami would be without him. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I don't know. It, it still feels. It does feel like we lost a piece of something. That's we, for sure. We yeah. did. Yeah. Um, another thing I want to mention here um, is the promotion that we are still doing on ConnectedByWater.com which is um, the FIU hospitality, the Chaplain Hospitality Fund. Um, this is a fund that is in cooperation with the Southeast um, Wine and Food Festival to where they are collecting money and distributing that money to out-of-work um, dishwashers, waiters, bartenders. Um, they're assisting struggling business owners and hoping they can kind of reach – um, take them back from the abyss of possibly losing their businesses. Uh, we are giving 50% of all the profits every sale that we make on our website, I think, until the end of May. Uh, we've been doing it for a month already. Extremely generous. Um, so we're, we're trying to raise some money there. So I just want, if anyone's watching this, you know, please, um, it's really not about us trying to do a big promotion to make a bunch of money because trust me, we're not uh, with this promotion. Uh, and we are g trying to give actually a little bit more than what we're promising to give, to be honest with you. So um, it means a lot to us because this is, to me, one of the, obviously the coronavirus is horrible and whatever, and, you know, everyone knows that. Uh, but one of the byproducts that we all have to deal with is the economy and bad things that it's doing with it. And in South Florida, there is no greater industry, um, you know, or I should say no greater two industries than the marine industry and our hospitality industry. Those are the yes. two, two yeah. main things Each. that people come here for tourism is a huge driver, um, and hospitality and restaurants are obviously one of the big reasons that they come. I think I think it's just uh, really thoughtful to do it. I think a lot of people, you know, kind of don't get it. You know, once you explain it to them, they get it. But South Florida is such a seasonal place. Yeah. So you know, to lose three months in the season, yeah, is totally different than a lot of places. You know, so yes, yeah, especially the months that we lost. Right. I mean, you're talking, we lose March and April. Right. Those are our two biggest months right. of economic drivers down here. And the crazy thing is, is that I think Florida in itself, comparatively to other states that are of our magnitude, because um, we're a major state, um, did fairly well. I think all things considered, you know, we're not like, you know, the New Yorks and New Jerseys. And I'm not trying to do the compare game or say anything like that, but... Um, you know, I think we're going to come through this strong, but we do need people to pull together, and we can pull together. We've shown in the past that we're able to do that. So hopefully we can kind of provide for ourselves here and get out of this mess, you know, a lot sooner. Um, I want to give a shout-out. We are Connected by Water, presented by Joey Cardi Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Um, I want to also thank Joey Cardi for sticking in through us. Uh, we didn't podcast for about well, a month and a half, two months here, so uh, he kind of stuck with us no problem the whole time. And uh, right now they are offering 0% financing for 72 months and no payments for 120 days on select vehicles, which is a heck of a deal. Um, so if you're in the market for a new truck or vehicle, go over there, Joey Cardi, right off Federal Highway in Pompano Beach, and talk to my man, Dean. He's going to hook you up and help you out. Tell him I sent you. Make sure you do that. All right, cool. Said my piece. So one of the things <laughs> that always happens in this country, whenever we deal with some sort of national problem that we're all dealing with, are the conspiracies. Right. Right? So whether you believe them or whether you're not or whether you don't believe them, they happen. Like like wildfire. Whether it's Jeffrey Epstein or, you know, whether it's this new pandemic thing video that's been going out in the past couple of days. Um, there always seems to be, you know, some sort of conspiracy. And I'm not knocking anyone who believes in them sometimes they're probably true sometimes they might not be true who knows but one thing 
that is not a conspiracy is the fact that the city of Fort Lauderdale still has a sewer problem. <laughs> right? Ain't that the truth. And you are you are really on the forefront of, of a lot of this, and I give you a ton of credit, and I want to give you a shout-out, like, right in front of your face, right? Because you've really been on the forefront and been a, a true community leader with that whole effort, um, organizing the rallies and, you know, been all over social media, you know, getting people riled up and going about it as well as you should. Right. So I want to say thank you, first of all, for doing all the work that you have been, because I think you do a lot of work that goes into it that a lot of people probably don't see everything that goes into it from your end. Right. Um, so lay some knowledge on me, brother. Well, you know, like that whole that whole sewage issue and dealing with the city and the state and that kind of thing. Um, my main focus was to be the communicator. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I get it, you know, these uh, city officials, the mayor and the city commissioners and stuff, they have uh, inherited this problem. You know, they didn't create the problem. So I was trying really hard um, to be the communicator. But the things that I could see were so, unfortunately, unique in today's day and age. Like, there's not many people that spend five, six days a week in their boat in Fort Lauderdale anymore. Right. It's like, I mean, literally. And then the ones that, that do are, are doing offshore fishing. So fishing inside the canal system and knowing about every little park, every little dead end canal, every little sewer pipe, everything that happens in the intercoastal, I've been fortunate enough to be, to, to see it and to understand it. And then my big thing was to communicate it to the broad audience, to the broad public and then even more importantly is to bring our city leaders up to speed on where they're at with the water system here mm -hmm. you know what i mean because it was only six seven years ago when we're doing tv shows in the same water that we can't bring people fishing in anymore right you know what i mean yeah no, i do and um so that was my biggest goal and then i wanted people to understand that it's not just a city thing. It's a state thing. You know, it's happening all different places all across the state. Big cities like Fort Lauderdale are setting records for sewage mm -hmm. spills. But the small municipalities, people that are, you know, still on septic and stuff, are basically leaking the crap right into our ecosystems. Whether people want to argue or not, I mean, there's not much of an argument anymore. I don't think there's an argument at all. I right. Mean, it's, it's plain as day. Right. Right in front of your face. Right. So if I can just simply, you know, make people aware and let them make it a priority, uh -huh. and I think that's going to be the biggest difference going forward. It's a priority for the majority of people now, where the majority of people before didn't even know about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always um, look at Florida as, and as I've said this before, we're the last frontier of the United States because if you look at the dates of when we were actually settled and developed and, and there are parts of the way far west that were developed and settled way before we were. If you look at the gold rush that really brought everyone west, you know, but no one wanted to come down to Florida. I mean, air conditioning was still a kind of modern technology and, you know, there were the alligators and, and the natives that lived here and the mosquitoes. And there were the fact that you couldn't really build on our land because it's soft ground. And, you know, right. so... Florida developed comparatively to the rest of the country very late. So if you look at a lot of our infrastructures, a lot of it was built, what, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, you know right. what I mean? And it probably wasn't built that great or up to very high standards. Um, in other parts of the country were designed and built, but also then redeveloped. And, you know, they've already been through these problems. You know, we're going through them now. Right. You know, right because right. we're a very young part of the country right. you know if you look at new york and new jersey and you know virginia and they have places standing there or her from the 1600s you go to europe even longer we're from the 1950s right. yeah, the we're 1960s. Brand new still. yeah. yeah. so we're yeah. brand new so this is going to happen and it's going to happen all over the state just like you're saying so i look at the fort lauderdale situation almost kind of like as a roadmap for what other towns are going to go through it's funny you say that because um it has been a roadmap, but I think that guys like you and me that understand that roadmap 
need to communicate with the rest of the small cities, smaller towns right. across the you know across the state, across the country for that matter, and try to educate them the best we can so they don't make the same mistakes that we did here in Fort Lauderdale. And one of the one of the um, perceptions, which is totally wrong, is people think that because I've been bringing this up so much that I'm anti-development, mm -hmm. you know, or I'm against development. I'm not against development by any means whatsoever. But we're still developing like we did in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. We have to change. We have to modify. And part of the communication that I've been trying to develop with everybody is to make people realize that in 2020 that the developers have to change the way they develop. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. Yeah, I was going to say, like, how? Well, like, I'll give you an example. Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach, very similar. We have 0% shoreline left. Mm -hmm. Zero. All right, 99.9.9.999, whatever the hell that is. But it's literally zero shoreline left. Everything is seawall. Mm -hmm. We can't do that to the whole state. You know what I mean? We have to promote the mangrove system. We have to promote seagrass. We can't let these giant boats just run rampant like we did here in the Tri-County area. And we can develop communities that don't destroy the ecosystems. And if the developers understand the message and understand what we're trying to accomplish, it's very doable. For instance, how hard was it to conquer, like you said, the environment of South Florida, mm -hmm. right? We had to stop water. We had to fill it in. We had to do all these things. Well, that was something that, okay, let's call it a necessity in order for people to live here. They did that. We know we can do that. It was an amazing feat that we did that. And you're trying to tell me we can do that, but we can't fix it? We right. can. We totally can. Yeah. So, you know... I want people to talk about it, you know, at their dinner table. Mm -hmm. I want people to think about it when they're buying properties or looking at towns or. Or building, building things on spaces where you didn't think could be built on before and really turning. Well, now we're going vertical. Right. That's the scarier part to me is that, wow, are, are we, it, <laughs> we're not like Manhattan. We're not built on granite. Right. You know, are, are we going to be able to withstand all that stuff goes right into the ground? Yeah. And in places like Fort Lauderdale where the infrastructure is not up to par and those buildings going up one after another. Yeah. Let me, let me throw, let me throw this a curveball at you. Over in Port Charlotte, they're starting to do it. The cranes are going up on mm -hmm. the um, Port Charlotte side of really? Charlotte Harbor and they're getting ready to build condos. Now those communities over there, for argument's sake, let's say there's a, a thousand voters in each city district. And then they start putting up condos where a thousand people or 500 people that vote live in that condo. Well, what happens to public, what happens to the public that was there as their voting rights get diminished? How do they get diminished? Well, they just put in a thousand new voters or 500 new voters in that one condo who are all going to vote alike because they're in the condo, mm -hmm. which is going to be in direct conflict with the people that have been living there forever. And just from a numbers standpoint is they're taking the power away from the local voter. Mm -hmm. You feeling me? Oh yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. Don't see that. I never really paid attention to it until, you know, these big sewer issues. And I decided that I wanted to, you know, focus and learn and educate myself. But that's where these small towns like Port Charlotte can lose any type of local power very mm -hmm. quickly. So the condos not only, you know, are going up, but it's also diluting the power of the local people that are already there. And they don't get that until right. after the condos are already until after up. the fact. I mean, right. everyone's always... Hey, we're developing, we're moving up, we're, we're building stuff, we're progressing as a town. I mean, you look at what Pompano is doing right now. I mean, I even had the mayor of Pompano on the show to, you know, and we talked about it and 
you know, I just asked him, I said, are we going to be responsible about this? Because there's a charm to Pompano that we want to kind of keep because it's a really kind of like an old kind of fishing town. And, you know, we want to keep that aesthetic to it and we don't want to become Fort Lauderdale. And he was said he was mindful of it. And, and that was really the goal is to kind of keep it. But you, you always, there's a fine line with development um, that can spin out of control. Um, if you don't take the proper steps right off from in, in the beginning, kind of like you're saying, like there's a way to do it. Yeah, there's a way to do it. And, and really, um, it's all about awareness and education at this point. Yeah. I don't think the, I don't think the developers, at least, at least the developers have been here a long time. The big boys, everyone knows what we're talking about. I don't think they don't care. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? No, I think they care. No, they care. They love Florida just as much as the rest of us. And I think they're in a way better position to do it than for people to expect the government to do it. The government ain't going to do it. Mm-hmm. Government's, I mean, everybody's a little different, but I'll give you my point of view. The government's fucking worthless. You tell me one thing that the government does besides our military that is good and efficient and leads the world. Right. I mean, yeah, at, well, that's, I mean. You know, so I, I really got a lot more faith in the private sector. I don't believe in big government, sector. personally. I'm, I'm not a big government guy. Right. You know, I, I don't believe in big government. I, I really, I mean, I think we can manage, you know, and every, everyone should be able to create their own path without having to rely on the government to provide for you. I mean, that's just my point of view. That's the way I always kind of have seen it. Um, and, you know, what are you paying for? At the end of the day, you know, because like the, with the Fort Lauderdale case, you know, like we're talking about, it's like, where's the money? I got an answer what I'm paying for. I get bulk trash. Okay. That's about it. So bulk trash is the second Thursday every month. So I make it a point to either video it or sit on my front porch while the bulk trash comes and get it. <laughs> you videotape the bulk trash? Well, dude, I pay $18,000 a year for it. <laughs> That's my, you know, that's my property tax, and that's pretty much all I'm getting. I'm getting bulk trash. I love it. So you videotape these guys? Dude, and I enjoy it. When bulk trash comes by and they get all my shit, I just sit back, and I'm like, okay, this is what I get. You got to give them bonuses. Right. Sometimes, too. Like, you guys did a really good job taking that couch away. You know, I'm just sending my kid. I sent my kid to uh, Catholic school, mm-hmm. you know. Now I'm sending my kid to Catholic high school. It, is it St. Thomas? Givens, right? It's Givens. The Givens. So the, for those of you out in the in <laughs> in the podcast land, so you know, I went to Givens, right? I am, I was a Redskin. I guess they're Chiefs now. And uh, this guy over here went to St. Thomas. He is a Raider, and uh, we were rivals in high school. Well, you can call it rivals if you want, but I'll tell you the truth: is St. Yeah, Thomas is kicking the shit out of Gibbons for the last guy. forty years, the and they finally win. Gibbons finally wins. They get my kid. <laughs> we beat you in football when I was there, by the way. So sorry. When was that? It was 1990, I think. <laughs> Did you really beat us? Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Yep. Dominic and Jimmy was actually the quarterback, and he's the head chef at the Big Chill down there, Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> uh, I see him all the time. I give him shit about it all the time. I love doing. Um, I love doing local shit on the podcast because there's people in Colorado right now. They're just like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are talking about what high school you went to? <laughs> really? I went to Columbine. Who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah, but seriously, I mean, I got to pay for the kid, you know, to go to school. You know what I mean? I got to pay basically for everything. Right. So the bulk trash, it's a big, you know, it's a big day. How do you like it? It's a nice school, isn't it? I got to tell you. It's um, a nice place. It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. And um, I, I forget the number of kids that are in each class right now, but it reminds me of traditional high school mm-hmm. you know we visited uh st thomas and it reminded me more of a university than a high school and it's crazy because when i went there you know we graduated like 200 in our class and i was only 1986 so my kid just figured that she was going to go to st thomas because the whole time she went to st anthony's people were like oh your dad you know he's a good football player and this that and the other and st thomas this and st thomas that and then she went there and I'm in that Hall of Fame thing that they had because I played Division One and that kind of thing. And she just assumed that I wanted her to go to St. Thomas. So she asked me, or I asked her, I said, where, I says, where do you want to go to school? And she kind of hesitated. I was like, you want to go to Gibbons? And she was like, yeah. I was like, go to Gibbons. Mm-hmm. 
I figured, you know, she's a smart kid. She knows a hell of a lot more about the schools than I do at this point. I haven't paid attention. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just so glad that we had a little conversation because she wanted to go to Gibbon. She had some good friends there. And, um, you know, it's on the east side of town, blah, blah, blah. It's near the beach. Right. That's why I wanted to go there. It's, 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 you could walk to the beach from the school. Right. I, remember I went to St. Helens, and the school of gravitation would have been St. Thomas. I think everybody went to St. Thomas. I think I was the only kid from my class that went to Gibbons. Um, but my brother ended up, my brother went to Gibbons before me, and that's kind of the big reason. And then I'm like, well, it's near the beach, and I like the beach. Right. So that's why I went. But yeah, right. I mean, both good schools, though. I mean, you can't so, deny that. So do you know what day your bulk trash comes? Yeah. But every like, Monday morning. Every Monday morning? Yeah. You get bulk trash? You no, get bulk. bulk. No, Coral, Coral Springs is, yeah, bulk. You, every you get Monday. bulk trash every, once a week. Every, every week? Monday, yeah, wow. every week, brother. No wonder this place blew up like it has. We yeah. get, we get Coral once Springs, a man. Coral Springs, we, we roll differently around dude, here. Ah, well, dude, every enjoy week. it. I do. <laughs> We get it's once like, honey, a month. you want to get rid of this thing? Yeah, sure. Just throw it on the curb. They'll come Monday. That's awesome. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, ours is the second the second Saturday of every month. Second Saturday of every month. Yeah. See, I, I never, my problem is I never remember that. And where are you, John? Plantation. Yeah, plantation. Plantation. I'm out west, too. Okay. All right. Well, for all the listeners out there that totally didn't get it before i think everybody should sit back and you got to enjoy your bulk trash day see i love having a fellow <laughs> podcaster on with me you know he knows to talk to the crowd <laughs> <laughs> all right listen i want to ask you something what the hell have you been doing for the past two months as if we don't already know because you post like a madman all over the loop. but you've still been podcasting oh i've been podcasting the piss out of my podcast right like really um so it's it's uh the real guy podcast just give you uh, people long, check it out yeah the real guy podcast you start filming now long, yeah we're gonna start filming um i actually reached out to john the other day um via messenger i was just kind of figuring out what i wanted to get for the for the um studio for, for the studio and mm -hmm. i wanted to start doing the youtube um recordings also with, you know, he's such a huge audience on YouTube. And um, we actually put up some podcasts at the beginning on YouTube. And all we did is put a still picture in the podcast. And we had like a thousand people, you know, actually listen to it. Right. So my kid wants to get involved. And along with uh, Lamont, who's always produced everything for me, um, we're going to do a kick-ass nice. YouTube channel on top of the podcast. But, Very cool. But I had scheduled the podcast schedule to do one a week from february to the end of may because that's my fishing season mm -hmm. so i kind of like you know i was kind of like sitting in the, a groove where that wasn't going to be the biggest priority i was just gonna try to get one out every week and then because of the covid thing you know i had to totally change gears so now i'm knocking out two three podcasts a week mm -hmm. and i gotta tell you the audience loves more 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 right the more you put up, the more they'll listen. And then also, too, is a lot of people, I think, and, and I thought the same way, is like, oh, geez, if I got to do two, three, four podcasts a week, where am I going to come up with all that content? It's a lot of work, Ben. It is. But, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not horrible, but it's, you know, it can be very time consuming. But if you can feel your audience, you know what I mean? You can get on there and just bullshit. Right. And um, talk about things that you know you did and stuff that i didn't think that i would put up on my podcast before now that i'm putting up on it and, and I'm, I'm realizing that the audience wants it see when we started this <laughs> excuse when we, me you got going on over there <laughs> dude <laughs> my so last podcast you my got life. i heard it you, yeah, yeah soccer had the uh the, uh, the sniffles the, the other yeah, day. The allergy thing going. And I busted his balls about the COVID. <laughs> Can I tell you? What? I talk, I was actually on the Romberg show um, on his radio show last week. right? And I told this story because he's like, oh, whatever. And I'm like, he's saying artists aren't all there, not playing with a full deck. And I said, you want to talk about not playing with a full deck? <laughs> For the first three weeks of this whole coronavirus thing, I had the most severe sinus infection. And I was freaking out because because you don't know you don't hear all the stories and everyone's living in fear for those first couple of weeks because right, you didn't right. really know what the hell this thing was right so I'm like 
is this it? You know what I mean? Because it was like a bad sinus infection. They said that's where it would all start and everything like that. And, I, and I'm like, I kept telling them like this. I'm like, I think I have this thing. I have to oh. freaking out, right? So, yeah. So I went to the doctor and I was like, listen, I think I have a sinus infection. But I don't know what the hell this other thing is. Can you just check me for a sinus infection? Mm-hmm. And they look at me and they're like, yeah, you have a sinus infection. I was like, thank God. <laughs> I couldn't imagine what was going through your mind. It was, oh my God, I'm telling you, I'm like out there, like there, there's are stories of like, oh, the vitamin D and the sun kills us. I'm like laying out there like by the <laughs> pool, like like 10 hours a day, like trying to get as much sun as I can, like sweating my ass off. My wife's like, come inside. I'm like, no, five more minutes. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I'm trying to knock this shit out of me. <laughs> Hey, I think that's what saved Florida's ass. The heat, yeah, the it's heat. possible. Yeah, from from what I understand, that you know, the more you know, the more heat, the more humidity, you know, the less you know, contagious it can be, and you know, blah blah blah. And um, I think that had something to do. I think with it has it. something to do with it. And I think most of us are generally outside a lot, too. You know. Yeah, I'm like we're outside. It's hot. It's humid. And then, I mean, we obviously had the influx of infectors. You know, right. between the cruise ships and the big airports and stuff that we have. So, I mean, yeah, I'm a common sense dude. So I'm thinking, um, okay, well, why didn't we get it as bad as New Orleans and some of these other cities? And then, yeah, and then you listen to these freaking doctors that think they know something. So you assume that they know what they're talking about. And they say if it's hot and it's humid, it's harder to spread. It goes way quicker. So for Florida, yeah. We did pretty good. We did good. DeSantis is getting a lot of credit, which I'll take because DeSantis is a water guy, so any credit that he can get, God bless him. Uh, well, if anyone's listened to the show, they know that I'm a, I'm a big DeSantis fan. I don't really get too political about much, you know what I mean? I usually just try to keep it to, like, personal issues and stuff like that rather than getting involved with any quote-unquote issues that have been labeled political. Clean water, obviously, is a big issue that we talk about on the show. Um, we don't get into too much into like human rights and stuff like that, but, um, DeSantis, we're big fans of him here. And, yeah. um, you know, I mean, I, mean, I think he's going to be president one day. Personally, I, I think so. I, I think he's got the, you got to think about this. He's Yale and Harvard educated, right? He's Iraqi war veteran, right? Um, he's decorated completely. And he was a Navy JAG attorney. He's only 41 years old. Right. And so far, I think he's been taking the steps to become the greatest governor this, this state's ever seen. So to me, that's got president written all over it. Well, uh, let me make you feel a little better. Yeah, sure. All right, this is my DeSantis story. It's heavy shit. I so saw they they reached out to you, right? All right, so tell me. So everybody, every you know, all right. So the we're setting the record sewage spill records mm-hmm. in in Fort Lauderdale. And Fort Lauderdale, you know, is is predominantly a liberal, you know, Democrat. Down here we are, yeah. Yeah, Democrat, yeah. you know. So everybody says, okay, you know, if you got an issue, you know, you got to tell your governor. You got to tell your governor. You got to write your governor. Write your governor. Yeah, he's got to govern two states, basically. It's crazy. Right. I'm sorry, I mean, cut you off. Yeah, what you're saying, but but you know, so so you know, that's more of a, like, it's almost like a cliche, you know, write your governor. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm sitting back and I'm like. I'm going to write the freaking governor a letter. So I wrote a letter. I put it in the mail. And the same day that I put it in the mail, I uh, put it online. Put it on Facebook. I put it on Instagram. um, Did a little YouTube blurb about it. But it was all about writing your governor. Within five hours of putting that online, the chief of staff of the governor, this guy Shane, calls me up and wants to talk. And um, I was actually fishing that day, so I said, are you going to be around, you know, tomorrow, which was a Sunday, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. is a Sunday. He says, yeah, I'll call you around 1 o'clock. Well, I had to fish again the next day, so I'm getting ready, um, you know, putting my rods in the boat, making sure I got everything, and 1 o'clock comes around, and I don't get a call. And I'm like, yeah, typical government bullshit. And about 1.15, I'm in the car, I'm driving to Miami, I get the call, and a guy answers the phone, he says, yeah, my name's Shane, you know, I'm the governor's chief of staff, and we're really interested in in knowing about all the details with the sewage issues there in Fort Lauderdale. Now, this is Sunday at 1.30 in the afternoon, and this guy Shane spends an hour on the phone with me. 
he wants to know every little detail. He's like so concerned. And I'm just like, man, I was like, I was not expecting that. I was expecting the typical canned letter in the mail a month later. Right. Autograph picture. Right. And, um, the guy Shane called. Can you imagine that? You freaking send an autograph picture of the governor to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be typical. Right, right. That would be typical. It was not what was happening here. And I'm just like, man. So I asked, you know, I asked the guy, I was like, I was like, you're the only one in any form of government that's ever really, you know, sat back and actually wanted to hear everything and didn't just want to appease me, you know? And, and, and so anyway, we, we developed this little re relationship on the phone. And then he tells me, he says, listen, I'm going to give you my, uh, my deputy chief of staff's number, and he happens to be the head dude in the department of DEP, which is really a department that you that you know Fort Lauderdale is going to have to deal with, so on and so forth. Anyway, we Big went time. right, right. So we went on, and then DeSantis was actually planning on coming to Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. getting on my skiff. I was going to take him around Fort Lauderdale to show him the impact. Really? Right. Dude, this was all in the making. And me, I'm getting a little nervous, you know, like, okay, uh, you know, I'm a big shot in fucking Fort Lauderdale and I can, you know, spew off and do anything I want here. But now if I can got the governor on my boat, I'm going to have national coverage, you know, which we started to get. And, um, all right. So I'm getting a little butterflies, but I am just thinking to myself, I'm actually going to get the governor on my boat. And I'm going to take him around Fort Lauderdale, and we're going to talk like you and I would talk for an hour. Mm -hmm. And then the COVID came, and then everything freaking stopped. Yeah. You talk about getting a kick in the balls. How many kicks can you take? And then you get a big one like that. I thought I was on the right path. I'm sitting there with the governor that we all have faith in, mm -hmm. at least the people that are under the water. Right. And then COVID comes, and the door shuts like a garage door. Except it's broke and it's still shut. Yeah, it ain't opening anytime soon. Right. I'm glad at least that door. But anyway, that's my DeSantis story. Yeah. So. It'll yeah. happen, man. He'll come. We'll pick it up. I want him on the show, too. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have him. I'd be like, you know. I think. Yeah, but you know what the funny thing is? I always joked, like, if he would come on the show, it would be like, like, remember Chris Farley? When he had, like, <laughs> like when, what was it, Paul McCartney that came on? It's like. Remember when you guys wrote, like, Let It Be? Goes, yeah, yeah, I remember. He goes, that was awesome. <laughs> like, that was pretty much the extent of the interview. Well, I, in a funny way, I think, um, well, you, gotta, you always got to try to pull the good out of everything, right? Yeah. The way this COVID thing went down and the the practice that the governor's getting, like, you know. like The crisis you, practice, yeah. Well, just think, he was on TV three months ago, and he looked so uncomfortable. Like most governors look. Well, you know? I mean, it was it was a scary moment when before when all this stuff was really breaking out. Because imagine the worst fear if the worst fear came true, where it was like one of those contagion movies, right? Where everyone all starts breaking out in the hives and like everyone's got this and the whole world's on like in their deathbeds. Right. That's scary, and, and you're going to be the guy that's like kind of in charge of watching over all this. I mean, right. You, that thought's got to go through your head at some oh. point. Like, hey, if this is, is this going to get really bad, what am I dealing with here? Of course, it was going through his yeah. head. But think about what he looked like and what he sounded like then mm -hmm. compared to where he is in the last few interviews like we've seen him. And the only way to get comfortable in these crisis-type situations is to go through it. Mm -hmm. And, like, if you think he's going to be a presidential candidate one day and we have that much faith in him, all this shit that he had to go through during this COVID thing is going to help him in the long run, right? No doubt about it. So you pull the yeah, good. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Yeah. Like, so you pull the good out of the crisis. I think he's handling this thing great. I really do. Um, you know, and if if those of you that want to criticize him, have you actually listened to his press conferences and some in the advice that he's been giving and the direction he's been given? He's he's really kind of been a beacon for this state. You know, I really. It, and if you don't haven't think so, you, then you really haven't listened to what he's had to say. And I'm not just saying as a fan of the guy. I mean, obviously he's human. If like any politician, if they start going south on me. I'll call him out. I mean, again, sure. not like I'm a big political guy. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, I'm, you know, not the guy's boyfriend, you know, but it's like, you know. <laughs> well, you got to give him credit. But I am giving him credit. Yeah. You got to give him credit when it's, when it's credit to do. I mean, then, especially a lot of things he's doing even recently with the masks and stuff, then the, the things that he's acquired for our state just in the past few days. But just the, um, the imagine if Gillum was governor. 
No, dude. Dude, that, that race was way tighter than it should have been. So Can you we, imagine if that dude was governor? So would so would oh they would, God, would, would they would have would they would have busted Gillum on that crack thing if he was governor? Or do you does that get pushed under the table? Probably. Right. Probably gets pushed. One hundred percent. Probably. Ninety right, percent right. yeah, chance. That's a good point. Right. So messed up, man. Oh God, did you see those pictures? Oh, are we allowed to put those pictures up? Probably not. Put them up. Are you kidding me? Uh, I thought that John will leave that to I'll him. I'm all for it. Put it up. It. If it's against the rules or whatever and they get taken down, don't worry about it. We'll all be talking about it so much. It'll, you'll oh get twice God. the exposure. But freaking Gilliam. Gilliam? Gilliam? Yeah. <laughs> what an well, What's his Bob Graham's daughter was like doing great. And I was actually more feel, fearful of her. I'm like, man, she's probably, you know, she's got some momentum. She's got, you know, pedigree. Right. And everything like that. She's probably going to be a formidable candidate against DeSantis. And all of a sudden, Soros gets involved and starts throwing this Gillum in the mix and calling him like the next Obama. And like, she completely just disappeared off the face of the map. And I was like, did, did the Democrat Party really just do that? Yep. I thought that was crazy. Well, like, you think the And Demo then, then the dude almost gets elected. Dude, the Democratic Party is pretty much crazy at this point. Like, if you go, if you go back in time to, to just before that election, two months before that election, it was Graham's daughter that was just like leading the charge on the Democratic side, and all of a sudden, Gillum enters the picture out of nowhere, and gets like all the constituency for that side. I was like, how how the hell did that just happen? Yeah, that was it was manufactured. It was crazy. Dude, I'm used to my conspiracy theories. There you go. I just spewed one your way. Well, I'm used to like the dorks running, like friggin' the way Childs was and friggin' Scott. I mean, these guys are major nerds. So, you know, you kind of get accustomed to having nerds running. Right. And then we got Gillum and friggin' uh, DeSantis. I mean, all right, DeSantis is a little bit of a nerd. Gillum, I mean, I'm never going to go there. I don't know, man. Is I'm not cool going to go there. DeSantis is a veteran, man. Yeah. Iraqi, Iraqi war veteran. It's not that nerdy. All right, so so my mate Mitchell, God, best mate ever in the entire world. Anyway, um, this is like four years ago, and um, <laughs> so okay, after the big Obama thing, then you got you got what, which one, which big Obama thing? Both all eight years of it. Okay, <laughs> and then uh, so I thought you were just talking about the Baltimore riots. Sorry. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway um, Hillary. God, man, this guy's making me talk politics. That is good shit. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're not going to get, like, real politic talk like this unless you listen to something like this. So so, so Mitchell is, like, he, he's not into Hillary, but he's kind of, like, you know, lib. So he says to me, he says, Jesus, you know, I'm really kind of torn on, on how do I vote. So I said, Mitch, I said, don't overthink it. I says, think about the candidate. And then think about who is going to pick up the phone and book you for a fishing trip. Is it going to be Hillary or is it going to be Trump? Right? Right. It's just that fucking simple. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Yeah. No, that was the, that's a good way to lay it out for him. I mean, if you're a real guy, mm -hmm. right? Make him realize, you know, okay, where are we? What am I actually voting for? Where, where is my heart? Where is my brain? You know, what am I doing here? Well, think about, make it super simple. Right. So anyway, so anyway, he's mentioned to and mentioned it to me like five times ever since. He's like, you know, he brings it up and stuff, and I'm did like, he, did he vote for Trump? I that's you know, I didn't. He ask. didn't tell you. I didn't. Well, I didn't ask. Don't ask. Don't tell. Well, I never asked anybody else who they voted for. You know, so that's I'm not. True. I'm not going to ask him. That's true. I really, and I really don't give a shit who you vote for. I don't either. Yeah, up until the DeSantis thing because he's into the water. So vote for DeSantis. Vote for <laughs> <laughs> Does he listen to your cast? Does he listen to your podcast? Yeah, everyone, every single one. He's told me. You can email you. He he texts me. Hey, the, he texts me at the end. He's oh man, that last episode was better than than the one before it. Good. And every time it's like the same text. Well, this is his, what his text ought to be after this podcast. He should text and hey, next time have a beer for me. Actually, I'm gonna finish the rest of this beer for him. Okay. Yeah. All right. This one's this one's for you, Ronnie. All right, so now we just totally alienated everybody as a Democrat. <laughs> That's it. Hey, it's your problem. The, tr the truth is out. I tried as hard as I tried to keep this show apolitical. All right, how many? How many? All it took was one episode back from a global pandemic <laughs> for everyone to find out that I'm a flipping Republican, have as you, if they didn't already know. Have you vote? Have you? Uh, you vote every year? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Let me tell you something. I never voted. Well, I voted. Um, I voted for Ross Perot. 
Okay. Way back when. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, the only he, had, he had a lot of good things to say. I give two shits. All I cared about was, <laughs> all I cared about was, he's a business dude. John, do you want a beer? You might need There's one. There's no more beer. You guys late. drank a little. There's one in the fridge. <laughs> I know, I'm good. I know I'm a lady good. in the back room. <laughs> a nice lady. <laughs> so think about that. The, the only reason I even voted, and that was the first time I ever voted, and pretty much the last. Ross Pro was the first time you ever voted? First time I voted was Ross Pro. And the only reason I voted for him is because I knew he was a businessman. I knew he had to make payroll. Right. You know? Balance sheets. Right. So I didn't give a shit what his real you know issues were and, and policies were. All I knew is I wanted a guy in office that had to make payroll before so he had to, could think like I could think. Mm -hmm. Then I didn't vote for the longest time until Trump. Mm -hmm. For the same exact friggin' reason same I voted for reason. Trump. Yeah. That's the only reason. Because at that point, I didn't know anything really about Trump. Right. Except for he was on TV. And you're fired. I love that. That was great. I would have voted for him for that. Right. But really, the reason I voted for him is he was an entrepreneur. He made his own money. He had payroll. Because people that have to make payroll think about life differently than people that don't have to make payroll. No and, doubt about it. I'm I'm in I'm complete concert with what you're saying. And that's it. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. That's it. That's kind of yeah. like the same thing I told Mitchell. Keep it simple, right? I don't trust. Listen, this is the big. You talked about problems with the government, right? So the the biggest issue I have with governmental employees and service people, like politicians, right, is the ones that make it their career for life. Right. Yeah, you know, that's why it's like with um, even with uh, Marco Rubio. You know, I still kind of hold his words in a little off to the side a little bit a lot of times when he talks because, it's like, you've just been nothing but a politician, like, your entire life. You've never held, like, a real job. Never had to think you, about people. Yeah, even though if you've had, like, you have Republican values and you, you're a great talker and everything like that. But it's like I can only, you know, yeah, take that so far. Like, even if you look at a guy like um, you, you, like like a Dan Crenshaw, right, with the guy at the patch over his eye and everything like that. Well, at least that guy served as a Navy SEAL. He understands responsibility and accountability for a fellow man. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much a payroll is like making payroll. And you, like we got to make payroll around here for my employees. All right. Right. And that's, there's a big responsibility to that. Huge. You know what I mean? You know, I got to make sure everyone gets paid before I do. Right. You know, and that's pretty much the same, same, you know, thing like a Navy SEAL has got to make sure that everyone else lives before I do. Right. You know, that's pre pretty much the motto. And there's a lot to be said for that, for the fabric of who you are. Right. But when you're a career politician, like there's, we gotta have term limits. I, was I am just, sorry. That's what I was just gonna say. I I mean, you gotta be a term limit. The hell, I mean, if you put that to a national vote, it would be a landslide victory for term limits. Two terms. That's it, right? What what do senators have like? What is a six year term? I'm not, I'm not, something like that, right? Too much. It's got to be two terms. That's it. And for those two terms, I'm sorry, you don't get a lifelong pension. Like the government is gonna pay for, pay your salary for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? And you know you should. Senators and congressmen, I'm sorry. You should have to pay for your health benefits just like the rest of us. Oh, You're shit, a citizen right? of this country as well. You know what I mean? You shouldn't just get free benefits. Right. You're a citizen of this country just as much because you're in public service. doesn't mean you should be privileged. It's true. And when when did that happen? Like, when did it flip? I don't know. I really don't. I, as far as I know, it's always been like that, but it probably, it probably hasn't. But I have no idea. But I don't know how it got that way. Did they vote for themselves? Yes. You know what I mean? And they they, vote, oh, let's be awesome for us. And we vote for our own raises. We vote for our own health care. All that crap. Right. Yeah. I don't know. See. It's and, insane to me. Well, the, and, the, and, and they're never going to vote themselves out of that. It's a too sweet of a deal. Let me, let me tell you the biggest mistake that I ever made in life. At a, at, let's say, okay, I went full-time fishing guide. Call it, make numbers simple, 30. For the last 20 years, full-time fishing guide. I could get up. For how long? 20 years almost. 20 years, okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, can I? I don't know if anybody's ever congratulated me for that. <laughs> you should be congratulated for it. I should. How, should many, I... how many days a year do you fish? About 200. That's a lot. Keep 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 Sorry. me focused here. Sorry, Where the fuck Sorry. was I? <laughs> no, you, I you're talking about you've been fishing for 20 years. Okay, so for 20 years, okay, what I did... Is every problem that I learned about and that hit home with me, I could get away from by simply taking my client fishing that day. Mm -hmm. 
Eight hours goes by. I come home. Maybe I think about it for an hour or so, but I know tomorrow I can get that release. I can get that relief. I can, I'm with my client. I'm thinking about fishing all day. Mm -hmm. And in a selfish way, looking back at it, that probably wasn't the best thing. You know what I mean? Like I no, knew, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? Because I knew those fucking sewage spills were happening. I knew okay. the pollution was happening. I knew that the population of fish was diminishing. You know, and these issues were on my mind, but if I went to work every day, I could fucking get rid of that. I could make it escape from my life for eight hours a day, every mm. day. Do you think that's like the MO of workaholics in general? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Maybe like they're workaholics because they just don't want to face their like their personal realities. Well, I think it's a definitely a way not to do it. Right. I mean, I did it, and then when I stopped and I actually got involved and I actually started talking differently, like... When the hell did anybody ever hear anything from me unless I was trying to crack on somebody and make you laugh or I was putting a fish in your face? Otherwise, you didn't hear anything from me. Mm -hmm. And today is different. And I look back at it and I say to myself, God, I wish I could have touched those millions and millions of people, the same people I made laugh, the same people I made, you know, uh, Coin phrases with the, the same people that love me for everything else. If I could have simply educated them and been a communicator for the last 20 years, that was a mistake. I don't know, man. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I know, but still, that's what I feel. You feel yeah, me? Yeah, but your experience in those matters makes you effective today. Yeah. I mean, dude, I'm it's like, it's like a, like a surfboard shaper, man. It's like you did no, no, you're basically saying every board you create until number 1000 is pointless. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> or, that, or whatever, 1000, 100, whatever the, what, what they say, you got to do a lot of boards. Right, 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 right. Before you can really like feel it. Come like have a surfer approach you and be like, all right, what are your waves generally like that you're surfing? You know, what's your break at home like? You know what I mean? Are you surfing big waves? Are you surfing small waves? You know, you surf a mainly like shore break type. Are you like, you know, right. reef rolling? You know what I mean? And then you got to know how to design that board based upon the way. Right. And the height of the guy, the shape of the guy, you right. know I mean, the, his tendency, his experience. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of that comes with trial and error and experience. So it's like, you know, all the mistakes that you say that you made in the past are basically making up who you are today and right today you're viewed as a leader in the community. Right. Can you imagine would, maybe that? you wouldn't have been viewed as a leader in the community back then. Maybe you'd have just been some loud mouth kid and no one really gave a shit about. It. Right. But right. now you have credibility. Because huh? all those years you spent on the water. Yeah. Uh, and, so and, bam, put that in your pipe and smoke it. I'll dude, let's just stick to the beers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love you, Jeff. I really do. Dude, you, know, you know, I say that out of the goodness of my heart. I just try to, you know. It's true, though. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 seriously, I mean, I've made it a goal in life just to kind of reach out to the real guy and the guys that think like me that, you know, have things in common with me. And I've tried to break it down. I try to make it simple. I try to make people laugh. And I think staying focused that way, mm -hmm. people appreciate you. Right. And, yeah, it's taken a long time. I mean, I... Dude, at the beginning of social media, it was 50-50. I was either an asshole or I was great. Right. You know what I mean? All right. So I'm, 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 I'm getting... Some, some people are going to always look at you differently than others, too. I'm gaining market share. We maybe, deal with that in the, in the studio. Maybe the maybe 55% of the people think I'm great and only 45% is behaving <laughs> now. But kind of like wrestling. You know what I mean? It's like you need somebody to hate sometimes. Mm-hmm. I mean, how good would how good would the WWF been in the old days without Rowdy Rowdy Piper? Right, or without the Russian? Right, right. You gotta, you needed people to hate. You needed people to disagree with. So we used YouTube. We used social media that the way. Antagonist. Right. Use it that way, and then um, it's kind of like the guy you 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 beat up or you fight in middle school. They end up being best friends with in high school. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's kind of the relationship between Just me. Just like me and John. John used to beat me up all the time. <laughs> now we're pretty good buddies. <laughs> That's kind of like my relationship with the social media audience. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, how many people were like, God, this guy's a jerk. 
And then he Who we- said you were a jerk? Oh, man, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I don't know. Maybe I just know you as a good dude. Well, maybe, I maybe I didn't know the Jeff from before. Maybe that's it. Well, you don't fish for redfish, right? <laughs> like most of the red fishermen out there, at least at the beginning, thought I was a jerk. They just like sheep said, right? <laughs> I mean, you know. So, but but then later on, you know, they're like, "Oh, he's really not a jerk. He was just busting our balls." Right. You know what I mean? And um, which this industry needs desperately. Yeah. Oh, right. More ball busters. Right. How, we 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 are in the industry. We have more experts in our industry than oh any other God. industry. How this is why. This is why. This is why I did not want this to be a fishing show. I just wanted to be like, let's just hang out. You yeah. know what I mean? You fish, I fish. Yeah, whatever. Okay, well, we're just going to talk about a bunch of bullshit. You just couldn't swallow another expert. Well, I mean, well, I'm certainly not an expert, though. Right? You could have been. All you had to do was say well, you I could have faked it. I could have faked it. Right? I mean, like, yeah, I know all about this lure and that lure. We're sponsored by this and we're sponsored by that. And here's this guy and this guy. You know, here we go. And then you got to use this lure. I caught this many bass, right? And it's like, well, no. I don't give a shit about that. And the world definitely doesn't need another show like that. That's true. Very true. So, whatever. Here we are. You know, I got John scribbling away notes of all the crap that we talk about on the show, and he was going to put cool pictures up, and we're just going to hang out. We're going to drink some beer and hopefully well, hopefully, tell the world how to solve all its problems. Well, how bad us are you having John over here? I, this show wouldn't happen without John. Right. He's the, the, the proof's in the pudding. We haven't had a show in seven weeks. Right. Out of all the people that, that can appreciate having a John, it's me. Yeah. Well, because Lamont did everything for me. Yeah. I mean, from I mean, he 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 literally had to explain what YouTube was mm-hmm. fifteen years ago, and as he explained it, I didn't get it, but because I liked him so much and I had faith in him, I just okay. Yeah, you know what I mean, I didn't really get, you know, even what he was talking about for like two, three years later. But yeah, I mean, when you have you know somebody that you know that that is willing to produce for you, mm-hmm. it's not about him. I mean, he's not trying to make himself famous. That's real power. Yeah, I think when we first started this show, and John, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we I think we both had the mindset of we have no idea what's going to happen here. All I know is that I wanted the place to look cool, mm-hmm. and I wanted to just do it right. Whether or not it takes off, or anyone actually else wants to come on the show or watch the show, at the very least, I want to do it right because I don't ever want to look back on this thing and say. Well, if we would have gotten different microphones. Well, if we would have gotten better lighting, <laughs> it might have been better. Maybe it would have been a more attractive show. Right. I said, you know what? No. Let's just make it the show we want to make it. Right. See what happens with no expectations. And I think we're having fun. I mean, you having a good time doing the yeah, show? I mean, it's, it's like I kind of I give him full freedom to do whatever he wants. You know what I mean? And we'll come up with ideas. And, you know, and that's it. That's really it. You know what I mean? I mean, I. Totally, totally transparent about that. I mean, this this show by any means isn't just me. Yeah. You know? Well, and if it was, then it wouldn't have the effect, you know? Yeah. <sighs> Dude, that, that, it's when I look back at the old fishing shows, you know, the Mark Sosen shows and going even further back Ooh, then. Ooh, son. Right. And you going, it was all about, it was all about, uh, it was all about the character. The character was the expert. The character was the producer. The character was the guy that had relationships with the sponsors. And it's got to be a fre- breath of fresh air for the audience nowadays, you know, to be able to see through that because yeah. you, because of social media and shit. You know, like, you know, you don't have to just watch it and eat it. Right. You can actually look further into the, pe- the stuff that you like. And people can see behind the curtain now and they're like, oh. Yeah. 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 I want real. I want authentic. That's it. See, I want, I want, I, I just hope to God that um, Lamont, Chip, Better Duck Studios, one day gets the credit that he deserves. He was friggin' a decade before the other YouTubers. Mm-hmm. He produced The Lunker Dog, made Lunker Dog a name, made Lunker Dog a brand. He was the first YouTuber to do that for somebody else, right? The phrases, the slogans, the lunker cons, the all the original stuff. I just hope one day people look back and be like, Better Duck Studios, Lamont was the first. He was the r- original guy. Because can, he deserves it. Can we put a picture out yeah, of him right now? Sure. Yeah. John, John, you, you, up. Do you, how do you feel about that? You've been following a long time. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I do. I, I agree. He, uh, he he puts in a lot of work. He does a lot, but he probably doesn't look for, for anything in return, really. Just wants to see a good product and proud of what, what he puts out there. It was always an artistic value for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I just hope that the people in his industry, the people that are into production, you know, look back and realize who that guy was. Because it's like one of those things, you know, it happens to fishermen all the time. That some of the best dudes, some of the most innovative people, some of the guys that really, you know, were light years ahead of everybody else, never get noticed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It happens all the time. Yeah, it's Throughout wrong. history. It's like you're saying, throughout history. Right. It always happens. Right. For sure. Even, I mean, talk about, you know, I'm not a fishing expert. I, I'm an angler. I enjoy fishing. I've been fishing my whole life. I don't do it for a living. I know enough guys that do it for a living that are experts like you to know that I'm not. Right. You know what I mean? So I would never even claim to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this guy, you, you're 200 times a year. I don't fish 200 times a year. Right. So why would I even for one moment say that I know more about fishing than you? Not even close. Right, right. Right? But I am an artist. I am a painting expert. You know what I mean? Right. So it, that is something I can claim. Right. right? No worries. So I can say, you look at Van Gogh, the same way. He sold one painting his whole entire lifetime. And now he's right, revered that, as one of the greatest artists of all time. And people like, I even know his name. <laughs> right. 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 But th- th- that's just one basically global world, like everyone knows the name Van Gogh. That, that's the one example I could point to that situation to let everyone know. That, yeah. It, that's, that's another example right there. Well, with social media, maybe we can get um, some of these people to deserve some credit, some credit before they die. Right. Be good. Well, the Andy, Warhol, Andy Warhol with the 15 minutes of fame, right? And say that he saw the way media was going. Right. Even if you look at the way he ran his studio, he didn't create every piece. Right. You know, it was, he did it. I guess even like Rembrandt and all them, they had like teams of artists working for them. Raphael and the you know, the teams of artists, but they were like the main person, right? So if like Dennis Friel was going to do some huge mural and I sub out a bunch of different artists to fill in you know it would be dennis reels mural same thing right but andy warhol did it differently yeah he had what is the artworks place in new york and he would basically have people do full paintings and screen prints and different things like that and at the end he just walk over there and sign it <laughs> it's an andy warhol right you know he had really had nothing to do with the piece half the time but the, his whole play on that was that's the way the world's heading right it kind of wasn't wrong if you look at the way we do a lot of things now where it's like so many things are just reproduced and mass produced and just looked, and looked upon differently. Right. You know what I mean? So. Well, with new media, with new media, there's people that are getting noticed and getting credit while they're still alive. You know, people like Skip Smith. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the book and, you know, all the angling and stuff that he did. Years ago, the only, the, that guy would get credit, but like I said, it'd be so far after the fact. You know what I mean? It'd be something that it was a memory or well, something. There were like one or two guys that did back then: Zane Gray, Ted Williams, Ernest Hemingway. It's about it, right? Yeah, all right. So, you know, but that, all the other anglers that were doing great things were right. You never heard about them, knew about right. them. If they're lucky, they got into a sport fishing magazine. Mm-hmm. You know, the Almighty. Right, right. <laughs> the Almighty, Almighty print. We should we should get into that a little bit. But I get it. I get it. I got to take a leak. All right, we're going to put it on pause. We'll do a pause. <laughs> I'm like that. And all the podcasts that have started, right? So for whatever reason. For whatever reason, seven. They, they don't want to do the investment anymore. Or they after don't, seven. They just like they figure it's not for them. Right, after seven, they're done. And then, um, and it's less than... Five percent of all podcasts that ever hit hundred episodes. Really, really. And the only reason I even know this is because I subscribed to the Lipson podcast. Right. Yeah, that talks about all this kind of crap. Oh, about podcast business and jargon, and right? All that. Analytics yeah. and you know how what what are good analytics, what yeah. isn't, and that kind of thing. But the um, couple of things that I that I um, I learned just recently is I thought the podcasts. Um, we're going to freak out and really, you know, overachieve because everybody was home because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Right. And then listening to their stuff is podcasts are actually down 14%. You know, there's a lot of parts about what happened in the last couple of months that I'm 
or I should say parts, but results that were shocking to me. Like, just in general, people's attitudes, you, you'd think, oh, people would maybe get into diff this, that, more, or, you know, maybe they would have, you know, maybe people would have bought online more. And then been the retail sales shut down, but understandably so, because people were worried about their, their income and, and right. all different things like that. But there's like all the stay at home things that you thought that people would do, you know, just maybe just didn't happen. Uh, except for Netflix and the Tiger King, you know, like right. <laughs> shit like that. That Tiger King went crazy, but everybody pegged that one. But yeah, there's a lot of things that would, you thought would make common sense that didn't actually pan out true. Right. The podcast thing is one of them, right? And then listen, people, all the things that people are going to read more books, or I'm going to, you know what I mean? Oh, this will be, give me more time to my children, and then the people are like I don't want to see my children now. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from me! We've been together for too long. Well, I think I think Lipson did a really good job explaining it. Um, people in their daily regimen, their daily routine, um, they had their time where they listened to their podcast, right? And that's been disrupted. Either one, they're not driving to yeah. work. They're spending two hours a day working yeah, with no their commute, kids thing, because no of school, whatever. But they're just, you know, everybody's off. And now if everybody stays off for a couple months, then of course it'll come back. Right. But it's going to do exactly the opposite again. It's going to go back to normal and then hopefully, you know, but anyway, it was, it was a weird stat. I didn't think, I thought more, I just, you know, yeah, common no, sense wise, I would have thought more people would be listening because they had nothing to do. I thought so too. And um, we even debated doing the remote thing, like with the Zoom, you know, and doing like a Zoom meeting. And then I saw like a few other people doing that. And my first thought was, I don't think anyone's going to want to watch that. <laughs> like right. who wants to watch someone else's Zoom, Zoom call? Right. You know what I mean? It's like, it's bad enough. We're all doing Zoom meetings for this, that, or the other thing. And we were, I mean, for different relationships that we had and different meetings that we needed to have. But um, I was like, well, that just looks like a Zoom call. Right. And I don't think anyone wants to just listen to else and someone else's work call. You know, the, being in the studio is different. You know what I mean? But you yeah. know, just hanging out with the mics and everything like that and being in the room and all that, it's, it's like... More free flowing when you could talk to someone face to face. See that that was always my thing. I was like, I want to do all my podcasts face to say fa yeah. face to face because I'm a face to face guy, and I think if you sit down with somebody for an hour or hour and a half and you and you talk, then you know you leave that room and you have a different relationship. But because of the COVID, I had to start going mobile. I had to start doing virtual. Yeah. And God knows I went through my bumps and bruises. If you listen to my audit, was, was it hard? Well, I just didn't do it, and I'm not exactly a tech freak. Right. And then Lamont's not around because everybody's in hiding. Yeah. So I'm going through it. So I start doing um, Skype. Yeah, Skype was pretty good, but it sounded like shit sometimes, and you talk over one another, and it was like, eh, it was okay, but it didn't get me. Then I did the phone app thing, and then you're only as good as your connection. And then I finally started doing Zencaster which actually sounds pretty good, and I think that's my avenue for the future. Mm -hmm. But, um, God, if you listen to some of my recordings, the audio was so bad. Really? But, I, but it did force me to go through it. Right. And now they're not bad, and we can do it Well, that was the time to do laptop. it, too, because I think people were very forgiving <laughs> right. about a lot of things during that time because everyone had yeah. empathy for what everyone else was going through. So, like, I remember I was I was – I actually started watching one – uh, I'm not going to say who it was because I don't want to throw them under the bus or anything like that. But, it, you know, it was um, it was probably someone that we all kind of know. And it was a three way call, video call. And they kept on. The, right. Like the pauses and stuff right. like that. Right. And then, you know, one guy would fall off. And you'd have to call back in. Like, wait a minute. Is that guy back on? Hey, there he is. Well, you know what I mean? And I'm like. I started watching that, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to put the John through that. I'm not going to, you know what I mean? And I'm not going to put myself through that. I'm like, we're not doing that, you right. know? And so it's like, once I started kind of seeing all that, I'm like, you know what? I got a feeling that in a couple of weeks we'll be able to get this thing going. So I'm just going to be patient and wait. And, right. You know, now I'm glad we did. Like, here we are. Like, the past is the past. Let's put behind us. Here we are face to face. And well, I, I tell you what made me feel comfortable was um, I did a podcast. I think it was my third one with Tom Rowland. Mm -hmm. And we did it on the phone and uh, <laughs> I get a horrible connection and I dropped him like three times <laughs> <laughs> and he just kept going. Really? He, yeah. He just kept going. So he would, he would call back and he just kept it on the podcast and had the call back and everything. So I was like, fuck, if, 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 if Tom's going to do it that way, then I got, I got nothing to hide. <laughs> so anyway. 
That's funny. <laughs> it is kind of funny, right? <laughs> yeah, because I just, I had the image, you know, okay, he had the Picture Perfect podcast. He had the right fucking audio. He was the guy, you know. Yeah. I want to model my podcast after his audio quality. And then he did that, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Oh, yeah, we've had a couple of hiccups sometimes here in the fishbowl, but I call this the fishbowl. I like that. Because of the glass. Yeah, very good. People yeah. outside looking yeah, in. People look at us swimming around. All right, tapping on the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking a little bit about um, fishing legends earlier. Was there someone that you kind of always looked up to when you were growing up? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you, it's, 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 I'm glad you asked that because it's a good story. People are on this storytelling stuff. Andy Mill. Right. Yeah, you were just on his show. I, I did you? a. I, that's I'm gonna get into. All Is that this. his house? I went to his house, right, and uh, did the podcast. But, um, you know, like growing up here and being um, into tarpon fishing my whole life, and then I was personal friends with the Everett family. You know, um, I actually graduated with um, Chrissy's sister, and um, so growing up, I always knew who Andy Mill was and then was somewhat infatuated by him because of all the tarpon stuff that he did mm -hmm. and then those early tarpon shows and that kind of stuff. F fellow uh, brand ambassadors for Maui Jim named Andy. Andy called me one Sorry, day. Sorry, I mean, yeah, okay. random fucking comment. Way to throw that in there. Way to throw that in there. <laughs> Plug for me. I'm just like Andy Mill. No, I'm not. <laughs> Andy called me one day to go fishing. Okay. And, uh, I got some big calls before, you know, I got Bill Dance, I got friggin', mm -hmm. you know, other TV dudes and, but Andy called and wanted me to take him fishing during the mullet run and he booked a trip and, um, I was just totally floored. Yeah. You know, I mean, this dude was like a, you know, a, 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 a legend to me. Somebody that I would be like, man, if I could ever be like that, and then have that dude call me to go fishing. It's awesome. Ah, dude, it's like yeah. I could I, you know, I could I couldn't freaking believe it. And then now Andy's doing a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. It's called The Mill House. It's a great podcast. But it's traditional, you know, interview style. And he's got all the greats on there. Yeah, I think he started with like I saw Skip was on there. Yeah. Skip was just yeah. on there. He did two episodes, Skip Smith, but he did Chico Fernandez. He did um, that guy Huff. He mm -hmm. did uh, Flip Pallet. He did Chico Fernandez, blah, blah, blah. And then just in case I wasn't floored enough that Andy is a client, he invited me to his house to do a podcast. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to be on the list with those fucking other guys? This is what I was trying to tell you earlier. You don't want to listen to me. <laughs> I'm telling you, you don't, you, Jeff. I'm just saying it. You're a leader in the community, my friend. I, I'm trying. I'm trying, but Jesus, it's just some things just totally floor me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's good to stay like that, though. You know, I heard, I heard this this um story about Jamie Fox one time, and Jamie Fox, obviously, everyone knows Jamie Fox, right? Huge house in L.A. or whatever, wherever the mansion, you know, because right. he's a acclaimed musician and an actor and comedian and everything like that. He's like megastar. He has a room in his house that is unfinished. And it looks like garbage. And it looks like trash. And he's never going to do anything to that room. And someone asked him why. And he goes, because I never want to feel like I'm finished. Like, done. I always want to feel like I got something to be hungry for. And he goes, and I also never want to forget where I came from. So that room's never going to get finished. Hmm. And it's in my house, and he goes, I look at that room every day. And then he's like, it frustrates the hell out of my wife because she's just like, what? But then she's like, <laughs> when I really laid it out for her one day, she's like, all right, I get it. You broke it down for her. Yeah, I think that was a really cool story. It is. Because it's like, you know. No matter what fame you can come across or how big your head can get, you know what I mean? I mean, Lord knows we've had a lot of successes here at the studio, you know, but we've had a lot of trials and, you know, errors and just, just like anybody else. But the only reason I bring that up is because it's easy sometimes when you get the big moment to get the big head and think that it's always going to be this great. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I remember one time when we were doing this whole 
bridge ceremony. You know, a little bit of freaking line around the bridge of people wait, waiting for my autograph on Prince and everything like that. Like, oh, this is great. From this moment on, this is always going to be like this. And it's like, no. <laughs> it's like, not. You know, just, just enjoy that moment. Yeah, you know enjoy what I mean? that moment for sure. And then just, just, you know, and just keep being who you are. And hopefully at the end of it all, you can look back at your life and be proud of what you created and proud of the people you surrounded yourself with. Yeah. That's the way I look at it, at least. Yeah, I think well, I think that's a, the right way to look at it. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, and it keeps you humble. Yeah. Keeps you, know you know humble, I mean? but you got to, like, look at it. You went on the Andy Mill show, and there's a guy that you really looked up to your whole life, and it's just, like, accept that moment for what it is and enjoy the hell out of it. It's a great moment. It is a great moment. It, 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 I don't know. It just, totally, it just totally floors me. Like, I, can, I never can get yeah, over it. It should. You know what I mean? And it's good that it does. Right. Right. right it's right. good that it floors you. I mean, God, I mean, you think about those people that go through life that have accomplished so many things. Like, what floor is Michael Jordan at this point? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Winning a big hand at poker. You know, who knows? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the guy. But, like, what floor is, like, those that have it all? Uh, well, I do know that. And is that, like, a good thing? I don't, you know what I mean? Well, I do know that Jordan's trying to rack up his sport fish. You know, he, mm -hmm. he likes his sport fish. Catch 23. Yeah. Yeah, he likes his sport fishing. Mm -hmm. You know, Mitchell was actually made on a boat with, with Jordan. My, my George took him out one time. Right. George Gods. Right. Shout out to the Unfathom George Gods. Right. I almost, wore my unf one time. I almost wore my Unfathom shirt here today, but I wore it yesterday. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was trying to be, you know, I knew that, you know, I was going to meet Jen and I wanted to, you know, yeah. give you the right impression. <laughs> the <everything>. nice lady. <laughs> You can't wear a you know, shirt for two days and show up to connect it by water, right? <laughs> oh, my God. George is going in his second season now. He's doing great, right? That show is a masterpiece. I love George's show. Yeah, you really, really, George is good people. Well, the other thing, too, is like George is like, um, with this with his show, the Unfathom show, is like he's, you know, he's bucking the system. Mm-hmm. And when he and he bucked the system, and I mean by that is you know he's actually most of the episodes are actually about his guest and his guest lifestyle. He calls him co-host, right? And when he first did that, I was like, well, this is either going to be great or it's going to be a bust. Mm -hmm. And going into a second season, obviously, it's not a bust. If anyone's seen the show, they know it's beautiful. It really is the one you, with you know with uh, Jacob and and. Um, you know, what's the cabin and all the work that they do? They do fancy color blind media. Yeah, color blind, blind yeah. media. Those guys are artists, man. The really, really good stuff. Yeah, I was I was lucky when when I did my first episode with George. Um, Kevin was actually on the other, you know, the um, the boat, you know, doing the filming and stuff. You did two with him, right? Did two with him. I did. Yeah. I did Florida Sportsman, and then I did the Unfathom. But um, the first one is I I got to know Kevin a good bit, mm -hmm. which was uh, really cool. Mm -hmm. just, you know, he's, he was, he was, he's, you know, George's Lamont, you know what I mean? So I could relate and I understood, you know, Kevin's role and I understand that, you know, George is great, but you can only be so good without a guy like Kevin. Mm -hmm. So to get, you know, just to, just to have the relationship with not only George, but also Kevin, I thought was um, golden. That's all. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I did my episode with him and I watched the rolling credits as a Dennis Real co-host, I was like, ooh. Put you right up there. That sounds yeah. fancy. You could put that on a fucking resume. <laughs> <laughs> Co-host of a fishing television show. So yeah. So what's up for you for the next um for the next foreseeable future here? Because I mean and I don't mean to say that in closing because it's totally not in closing, but I mean that like we just went through this whole two months of whatever the hell this was. Right. And what's your vision for like summer? Well, like, what do you, what do you foresee happening here? I mean, not just like in the world, but like in your life. Let's see. And now that you ask, you brought me right back to reality. There's a little cold. There's a little cold. No, I'm not serious. I mean, it's like, Sorry. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it, reality is reality. So, you know, you can't only stay away from it for so long, but there's a little cold spot, you know, right in my uh, diaphragm because I know I'm going to get by. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I'm more concerned about, Next September and October. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where you work right now for them. And that's what gets you through that time. And 
I just don't know how it's going to pan out. Like, I don't buy this shit that the fucking economy is going to come back with this huge vengeance. I think there's going to be a burst of demand for people like, you know. People you, need to dip their toe in the water first. They're not going to jump right back in. Well, it just financially. All right. The, I need a haircut so fucking bad, right? So, oh, so we can do that at the end of the show. We can do it right now. Well, I'm going to. I got a really great set of X-Acto blades. Well, what, you want me to do it? <laughs> no. What I would do, to, but what I want you to realize is like, like, so that, that type of business is going to have a nice spring to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Cause I'm just, I'm going to go, my wife make, oops, my wife does hair. She has a nail spa, you know, mm -hmm. big time salon. So I have to make at least an annual appearance there to get my hair cut. Right. And right now God knows I need it. And there's going to be some sort of spring to the economy, you know, that type of business. But when you talk about fishing guides in I've made it so part of my social network to have connections with these dudes. And then of course myself, it's a little different because it's not a $30, $40 decision. Mm -hmm. It's a two, three, $4,000 decision. If a guy wants to go fishing with me during tarpon season, he has to book a year ahead of time. He has to pay top um, rate for his airlines he has to pay top rate for his hotel stay. And it's a big decision. And it's a lot of dough. Mm -hmm. Next year, during our peak season, how many people are going to not have that extra dough because of what we're going through now? And that leaves... I don't think you can worry about it, though. I can't, you can't worry about it, but there's a, there's a, like, there's a little... Th it's. I know you're thinking about it. Yeah, it's like... Well, here's my take on that. Okay. All right? And maybe this will make you feel better. Maybe it won't. Okay? I think you you got to make a decision. Right? You're still going to do what you do. Right. Right. So that's your decision. You're doing that. Okay? So, I mean, you, of all people, understand how to adapt to different scenarios. Right? So maybe there's something down the road that's going to arise. You got to have, like, faith and hope that if that situation doesn't rise back like you want it to. Mm -hmm. I have faith in you that you're going to be able to think of something to, to make that situation adapt. Yeah. I, I, I know you will. Right. One way or the other, right? You know what I mean? So, so I, I wouldn't worry about it so much. Right. And it's the same with me. Cause you and I are very similar in that respect. I think to where like, you know, you can make, you know, something out of nothing. You know, because you got the drive, you got the creativity and, and everything like that. And you can always think of an idea that's going to help or get you out of a scenario or something like that. You know, so I would just remain faithful and just hope that it does come back. And I think it will. Like, all right. <sighs> in that whole, a lot of people were bringing up this whole flu pandemic in 1918. Right. Right. And it's, they dealt with that flu pandemic that filled, killed 50 million people. And they also went through World War One, and they say that it took about five years to recover for that society to recover that had no global communication, to had elementary science for their medicines at best, mm -hmm. right? And it took them about five years to recover. So in today's day and age of our global communications and our modern technology, I think we're going to recover a hell of a lot quicker than five years. Okay. Trying to be positive. Uh, but that's yeah. just kind of the way. That's my perspective on it. The five-year perspective, my five-year perspective is similar to yours. Huh. My 24-month is not, maybe. No, what I'm saying, I think it's going to be. Yeah. yeah I, think, I, I think we'll recover in a matter of months. I hope so. I hope so. And I just, I'm just a little bit more worried about the corruption. Oh, God. That, that's my bigger fear. God knows there's going to be but, plenty. You know, I, I think it's going to be more like who's profiting off of all this? You know, who owns these virus patents? Like all of that kind of crap. You know what I mean? Like, why can't we use like medicines and, you know, listen to certain doctors that are saying that this medicine works and they're like, oh, well, we got to wait till this vaccine comes out. That's going to be much more expensive or this medicine is going to come out. That's much more expensive that we actually own the patent on. Yeah. And you know, I think there's some truth to those things too. Yeah. And of course the insurance companies will take full advantage you know, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, do I'm we, not an expert on any of that stuff by any means, so I'm not trying to claim to be. Well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an economist, right? 
Are you really? Not really, but fuck it. I went to college. There you go. And um, where'd you go to college? University of Connecticut. And uh, I didn't finish there, but I probably got more credits. I probably could have had a master's with all the credits if you add them up for all the different schools. But anyway, being an economist, <laughs> you like the way I did that. I did. I really did a lot, actually. <laughs> being an economist, uh, we we were we were due for we were due for uh, a crash here in the next few years anyway. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who say we're sitting on a bubble. Well, I'm just saying, this is the way it works. I mean, right. it goes so long, and then we crash, then we peak, then we crash, then we peak, then we crash, and it's, you know, it's been like that forever. It's part of the way the economy works, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I was thinking we were going to crash probably in the next three or four years anyway, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the way I look at that is I look at all the restaurants and the businesses that you know, have opened in the last decade, and you're talking about restaurants. I mean, dude, you need two million bucks to build a restaurant. And then you have to friggin' be able to afford ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month in rent. And then you're doing that in an area that only supports, call it a sixty thousand dollar year average annual income. Mm -hmm. Something's got to give. You know what I mean? I do. So maybe, you know, the way it worked now with this bump that we're having, maybe it'll put people in a little bit different perspective, and they'll kind of look at business a little bit more conservatively and maybe we'll get a little longevity out of the next um, boom. Yeah. Maybe. I was talking to my wife about this last night um, and I said really my hope throughout all this is for the recovery part of it at least is that maybe we got a little bit humbled here and you know and I'm not even just talking about the virus I'm just talking about the entire mechanism of this whole thing that's going on. Right. And, you know, hopefully people might change their perspective moving forward on a lot of aspects, you know. Uh, yeah, they, they're definitely going to have to. Family values, how you treat people, you know what I mean? The little things like that, you know. Well, let me, let me Responsibility and accountability for you, for yourself and your actions, your family, you know. I'm gonna, th I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna throw this at you because most people you have on your podcast have sponsors and really can't throw this kind of shit out there. Mm -hmm. All right, so all the fish and stuff that we use, right? Mm -hmm. It's all made in China. I don't want anything produced in China anymore. Right, and people like you and me are thinking that way. Now, how many, how many, um, call them influencers mm -hmm. in the fishing world are going to bring that up and make it an issue to their sponsors? I mean, Yeti's, yeah. Yeti's got to be the biggest sponsor in the industry right now, right? Yeah. Didn't, a, didn't a Chinese company buy them? Dude, everything they right? make is it, from China. I think the Chinese company actually came in and bought them now, right? Probably. They're owned outright by, I think, a Chinese I really company. I'm, I'm not sure. And if you want to irritate people, say China, like Trump does. Yeah. It pisses everybody off. But anyway. Which he was right, by the way, about, about all of it. About China. About every aspect of it. He was. But you see what I mean? But Yeti being the big heavy in our industry, mm -hmm. when you go to ICAST and shit, they got the biggest friggin display big dude that's all china mm -hmm. so how many guys that are sponsored by yeti is going I guess to like we can kiss our yeti sponsorship goodbye Victor. well <laughs> and this is why i'm bringing it up because <laughs> seriously we're not I, sponsored by yeti so we give shit. What, i'm bringing it up because there's so many people sponsored by yeti sponsored by pen sponsored right. by all these companies that make all their shit in china how many influences are going to ask their sponsors or even bring it up zero none Right. So I'm going to bring it up right here on Connected by Water podcast. You're going to hear shit that you're not going to hear from the other influencers, so-called influencers. Mm -hmm. But these, you walk through freaking iCast and you look around. We don't have anything in the studio, anything on our website that's made up in China. I love you. <laughs> I've always had this stance and now it's like the, even now, even more. And, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these dudes that, oh, we got to boycott companies. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but if you're sponsored by pen and I have a relationship with pen and I love the fucking pens because they don't break and I'm tarpon fishing all the time. You it's need stuff that company. doesn't print, doesn't break, but I am bringing it up on your podcast and on mine and anybody else that'll listen. And if you are sponsored out there and you're a fan and you're listening in one way or the other, we have to call sponsors out and at least express that hey there needs to be change here mm -hmm. 
And I'm willing. I'm, I'm, on, I'm one that's willing to pay. I've always paid for my stuff. I'm willing to pay a little bit extra for my anything that I use for business, knowing that my neighbor is going to be in a better spot because of the economy. Right. You know what I mean? I'm, I I'm, I'm more than happy to pay $3 for a screwdriver instead of one, knowing that my community is better off. Mm-hmm. As opposed to sending the extra two dollars, or whatever the margin is, to China, mm-hmm. you feel me? A million percent. And you know, also to those brand ambassadors and guys that are sponsored out there, it's like you know, and you know, I'm a, technically a brand ambassador for Olakai Maui Gym. So if anything I ever say that they have a problem with, I have no problem with being like. Well, sorry, I guess we got to go our separate ways because I'm always going to be able to speak my mind. That's that's just my life policy, whatever. Right. No, right. no, no big deal. Um, but they don't ever really have a problem with any of that. Um, but you really can't call yourself sponsored unless you're receiving like a paycheck. That's always been my theory. You, you don't be it's just because a company's going to throw you some glasses, and just because the you know they're, they're going to maybe send you a free cooler. I mean, how much did that cooler really cost you? If you're going to go pay for that cooler, it was 300 bucks for right. one of their big ones, something like that. Maybe it was like $250 for a sweet pair of sunglasses. So you're going to accept that pair of sunglasses and for from now until the unforeseeable future, just so you can act cool and tell people that you're sponsored, you're going to give them all that advertising for what? Are they going to give you anything in value other than just a pair of sunglasses? you got to ask yourself that question. You know what I mean? So it's like... Where's the trade-off? You know, and I just think it's funny sometimes how that water, those waters get navigated. You know, it's it's smoke and mirrors. Yeah. You know I mean, and, and God, they, the fishing industry has to be the most guilty. Some of it's legitimate. Some, some of it some is. Of some, some of these guys, like some of these companies are stroking checks to these guys and say, we want you to represent us. Like some television sponsorship, like all Georges, we talked about it on Fathom, all the, the, all those sponsors are all legit. All his relationships are all legit. Everything like that. That's the real deal, right? But there are a lot of others, as you will know. It's the, the pros that are not. And we, we, we kind of label them as pro staffers. Promotional staff. Pro staffers, man. We've been fucking with <laughs> the pro staffers for a decade. Yeah. You know, somebody gives you a discount on some product and sends you a friggin' hat and a shirt in the mail, and then you run around and saying you're sponsored. Right. First of all, you're pro being, stands for promotional, not professional in that situation. And they they would they they invite the company to totally exploit them completely. For what? How did that? I don't know. Maybe I just grew up in it, so I never freaking like, saw I the you, upside. I think there's got to be a sweet side for the pro staffer. You know what I mean? Like we have people that we have relationships on the other side of this with our studio, right? right? Like Amanda and Emily, we try to make good with them on a lot of levels. Um, and they appreciate it, you know, and that's great. We have a great relationship with them. Um, but I also have the perspective of what we just spoke about, and I don't ever want to be that guy to them. Right. You know what I mean? So we try to treat them right. This is, this is my, my father taught me this. He says, in order to have a great deal, it has to be good for both parties. Mm-hmm. So good plus good equals great, mm-hmm. right? And he taught me that at a real young age. So... I grew up in the industry. I knew all the dudes doing TV shows and blah, blah, blah. I never never got asked to be part of a TV show or part of any type of media until after I started receiving over a million views a month for multiple years, and then I was able to, you know, penetrate. Mm-hmm. And my point is... I got a lot of exposure and then the sponsors wanted a piece of me mm-hmm. after I got the expo- exposure and then I'm looking at it. I'm like, I got a million views a month on YouTube before anybody in our industry ever even thought you could get a million views a month. And we're doing this year after year after year. We're bigger than the TV shows. And then somebody wants me to wear a hat and a shirt for them. Mm-hmm. Are you fucking kidding me? And from that point, I thought to myself, I am going to be the voice of the sponsorless Mm -hmm. because the sponsor has been taking advantage of guys that are great fishermen for years. It's not a, it's not, you know, good for both parties. It's not a great deal. 
And until a sponsor comes to me and is willing to make it a great deal or a good deal for me, it's never going to happen. And Andy Mill said it the best to me. He said, Jeff, you're a pro's pro. He says, unless somebody throws a quarter million bucks at you, he says, don't even look at it. Mm -hmm. And I took that to heart. You know what I mean? Now, obviously, I'm in a different position than a lot of people. But still, the old theory where it has to be good for both parties to make it a great deal, these pro staffers and stuff out there are getting totally taken advantage of and exploited. It's very true. That's the way and, I look. and you know what? As an artist, I deal with that a lot. Oh, the artists get crushed? And I can proudly say that I've stood my ground. Now, that standing ground has affected relationships, right? Yeah. Which, you know what? I kind of... At in the moment, sometimes I would regret it and be like, man, did I make the right decision or do the right thing? But you know what? I gotta, I gotta stand my ground and I gotta believe in what I'm doing and I gotta f find the worth in myself, right? And if that person isn't going to understand that, then that's their problem and not mine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I really have to remind myself about that a lot because sometimes you could take it really personally because your art is a personal thing. Um, but there are companies out there that I, you know, I even heard on the street that have bad math me or, you know, whatever, like the, just because I stood my ground and refused to get taken advantage of. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, well, Dennis didn't, whether they say it like this or not, Dennis didn't fall for that. You know what I mean? So we're going to bash him or whatever like that. So it's like, no, I understand my value. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, is you got to look at yourself in the mirror and, and you got to be honest with what you see. Yeah. I mean, how many, how, how many people look at themselves in the mirror and can't quite stare at it and, like, really see what they can see? They look at themselves in the mirror and they can't even look at it because they don't even know what the hell they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole sponsorship thing. I don't know. I'm sure it's worked for a lot of people. But I can't tell you the amount of young kids that ask me if I get stuff for free. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, such a priority. And, you know, they're not my kids, so I can't give them a slap or nothing. But, Jesus, I just think about it. I'm like, well, who gives a shit, first of all? Right. And why is that important to these kids? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you're living in that, that instantaneous gratification kind of social media, you know, world of, you know, that's your clout. Yeah. It's just, it's just you know, just the whole, that, that whole sponsorship thing is yeah. such a, you know, so much smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Completely. Completely. I don't know. You mentioned before about um, and I've heard you talk about this on, on your show too. And I, I really wanted to ask you about this. You talk about you like you fish like two hundred days a year, right? Um, and I was hoping you can elaborate on that because there are people out there that claim to fish way more than that. Right. And I remember you brought up before like the physical toll, on how that affects you as an actual professional captain. I don't know about you, but when, when I get home from fishing, I'm kind of tired. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you do that. Some people are saying, oh, I fish 300 days out of the year. And I'm like, really? 300. You know, or did you like step onto the boat for like an hour on, on how many of those days? I don't know. You know what I mean? I, and I'm not trying to criticize any captains. Obviously, I don't do it for a living. So, I, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to seem All right, here, here's hypocritical what... or anything, but this is why I'm asking you. Because when I heard that, I agreed with you. I'm like, yeah, that is... A lot. Yeah. I mean, here, all, right. all right. So we'll, we'll spin it the positive way. 300 days a year? Okay. We'll count working on your boat, running errands that you need to keep your boat going and things like that as a work day. Mm -hmm. So then you can say 300 days a year. Okay. But physically, and, and we, we, when we took our little bathroom friggin' break, I was telling you, I broke my hand again. Right. I broke this hand. I got this little fighter's break that you get on the side of your hand probably eight, nine times now. And now I broke it so many times and the pain is there and you just, it's like every day. It's like, you know, you don't even think about it. And you learn that if you want to fish 200 days a year, that you're just going to have to live with these aches and these pains. It's part of being a full-time guide. But um, physically, it's no different than the other types of athletes in the world as a basketball player, or a football player, or a soccer player. If you, if that's your full-time, you know, if that's your full-time job, your body's going to go through it mm -hmm. and you have to live with it. And then when you hear people say that they do more than 200 days a year and okay, 
it doesn't hold true all the time because when I was 35, I would do doubles and shit and I'd laugh about it. And I'd be like, man, I'm going to get paid a thousand bucks today to go fishing. And I could giggle about it, but I'm 52 now and I don't even do doubles anymore mm -hmm. because I want to be consistently good every day and I'll burn myself out doing doubles. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, it's, it's that's the old vintage where as you get older, you work smarter, not harder and that kind of thing. But physically being a fishing guide is no different than being a football player or any other professional athlete. And, <laughs> you know, there's some dudes out there that break the rules, like Bouncer Smith and stuff. I was like, you figure, how can he fit, possibly physically do it? Well, he did. Mm -hmm. And he made some adjustments with mates and stuff so he could, but he still did it. You know what I mean? And he's your exception. You know what I mean? Guys, you know, just like friggin' Michael Jordan's an exception, Shaq's an exception. These guys are freaks. Mm -hmm. Bouncer was a freak. He kept getting on the boat every day, no matter what his conditions were. That, you know... I'm not even a big bouncer fan, but I respect the dude so much because I know that physically what it takes to do what he's had done. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then, um, so when you hear these dudes talk about, you know, their 300 days a year and that kind of thing, it's like, you just got to take it with a grain of salt and you got to realize that those guys too will be 52 years old one mm -hmm. day. And then they'll probably think of it more the way I think of it. Because you would have asked me when I was 35, I'd have been cocky and I would have been telling you the same shit. Mm -hmm. That's important too, as you get older, to have the perspective of what it was like when you were young. Oh, man. I, you, you know what really bothers me sometimes? Mm. Is I think about how hard I was on some of my older clients when I was like 35. Yeah. And I got them fishing at night for fucking 100 pound fish. And I'm looking at them like, you can't see that, dude? You know, and I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? But that's because I was 35. Now that I'm 52, and if I got a young guy on the boat, I'll ask him to tie the knot. Were you a cocky captain as a younger? Yeah. Yeah. I think I was more cocky on YouTube than I actually was as a captain. Okay. But I think at 35. I don't think that's fair to the client a lot of times when these younger captains are so egotistical and demanding of their the, for, the, the fortunate thing about the younger captains when they go through that yeah. is usually the clients are already in their fifties. Yeah. So they're looking at the kid like, eh, he'll learn one day. Right. And that's the cushion you get. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Right. Yep. Yeah. But, um, I don't think I was like crazy hard, you know, or, or unreasonable necessarily, but I do look back at it now and I'm like, geez, you know, it's kind of asking a lot for people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not like I'm taking them out to catch kingfish and bonitas. Right. You know what I mean? Every fish that we catch, you know, I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it demands the most out of you, whether you're a novice or you're the best guy in the world. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I look back at it and I'd be like, man, that's a little hard on some people, but you know, you live and you learn, you know, I've been able to retain a, a crazy amount of my clientele list. And I tell everybody in this business that that's your job. Mm -hmm. It's not fishing every day. It's about building your list and keeping your clientele list. That's your real job. Fishing is the exercise. Right. Your job is to, to build that book and to keep it. And I've been able to do that for a long time. So because of that, I can live with the mistakes that I made when I was younger. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I do. I do. Well, I mean, I can relate a lot. I mean, running an art studio is very similar. Well, business is business. Yeah, yeah business is business, but it's, I mean, we're working in a similar industry and we're handling a similar clientele. And, you know, we're all enthusiasts about what we do and what we're being, you know, revolving our business around. And, you know, and um, the art part of it, for me, at least, is second nature. That's the part I strive to get to, you know, to, to knock out and just get done. Like, once I get to the part where I'm actually creating, it's very just... Like, like you say at the fishing, that that's just, you know, part of your process. Right. You know, but, but there's so much of the day that's caught up with speaking with people and, you know, answering emails and running my team here and you know, getting through all the weeds. And, you know, I always say my life is just like a series of roadblocks on my way to the canvas. Yep. yep. You know, and when I finally get there, like, um, God, if I say this quote one more time, i chuck close. <laughs> say it, dude. All right. But it seems like every episode is like... Um, You're talking to a different person every time. Though, I know, so. that's that's the thing. I'm talking to a different person. <laughs> Poor people in the audience be like, really? He's making this quote again? 
the one person that listens to the show. Um, you, it's a, inspirations for amateurs, right? The rest of us wake up early every morning. We get to the studio and we get to work. Right. That's it. Meaning, like, if you're going to sit around waiting for inspiration to kind of hit you until you actually do the painting, you know, then you're not going to last very long in this business. Right. So by the time I get through my series of roadblocks and actually get to the canvas, my skill set better be second nature and ready to roll. Right. It's just like you when you're on the water. When your client comes on, you're on the water with your client. By the time you weed through all that and get them booked and everything like that and get them on boat and you're there and you got all your bait, you're ready to roll. It's like you want to convert that. Catch some fish. Right. You don't really want to think about it, though. Right. Or try to reinvent the wheel every damn time. Right. One of the philosophies I go by, and I don't know if you're a big Peter Tosh fan or not. Oh, yeah. Like Peter Tosh. Dude, everything about Peter Tosh. But I, I'm a big Peter Tosh fan, and a lot of it is because of his philosophy and his Soon message. And the one song. Oh, we're out of beer. Yeah, that's probably a good thing. The um, The one song that always comes back to me. And if you want, we can end the podcast on this. But he talks, you know, he, he has a song and it's, you know, it's you got to pick yourself up when you fall down and you get up and you start all over again. And you do that every fucking day in one way or the other. And it's okay. It's okay to fall. It's okay to bust your ass. It's okay to get kicked in the balls. You just got to pick yourself up every day and then do it all over again. And then if you do that, at the end of your life, whatever, you can look back and you can say, I gave it everything I had. Mm -hmm. And you can live with yourself, rich or poor. You can live with yourself, successful or unsuccessful. You get up every day and you start all over again. And you do whatever it takes. A oh, little Peter Tosh for you. I love bringing on Jeff because... Just like there's a prime example. He's like, we can end the podcast here. He's the guest, damn it. Well, Tell gotta, me when they end the podcast. I love it. Well, plus I got to pee again. You know what you're doing, man. <laughs> I could have talked to you forever. Do you remember how we ended the last podcast? I don't know. What did we do? We got all heavy. Well, we did. Well, we, we should try to get heavy. We got all heavy and, and in tears and all that shit. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We'll end on Tosh. I love, well, it's good to end on Tosh. You know, the one band that I've been, I put out a post recently, like, give me your... Your favorite island. I gave you reggae, a bunch. You gave me a bunch. I really got stuck on this stick figure. People. You ever stick listen to that figure? band? No. You ever oh. listen to stick figure? No. Check it out. Yeah? That's my plug for the day. Oh, I remember how we ended last time. Fire on the horizon. How we end. Remember I told you about my wedding? Yes. In the two islands? Yes, and yes, we're yes. connected yes, by yes, water. Yes, it's Hope Town. <laughs> we're always connected by water. That's right. One form, fashion, or the other. Yep. So, all right. Well, listen, if you listen to this whole entire podcast, I say thank you. And I also say that I am so excited to be back doing this. We're so excited to be back in the studio. We are open for business. So is Jeff. All right. And we are ready to roll with our lives here. So hopefully you are too. And hopefully everybody weathered this storm as good as you possibly could. I know everyone's got their own opinions on herd immunity and all these other damn things that's going on and all these conspiracy theories and whether or not the medical system is good or whether or not Trump's lying to you or Fauci's lying to you or the media's lying to you, you know, whatever your opinion is going on still doesn't change the fact that we were all home. That's right. All right. And we were all dealing with the same bullshit, right. Of trying to figure out what to do with the whole day and try not to go insane. And hopefully you got your groceries and hopefully you all stayed healthy and hopefully your families are doing well. We do wish that for you. Um, I know we expressed some opinions on the show today. Um, so hopefully you're all Republican now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The poor Dems. They yeah. just keep getting the shit kicked out of them one form, fashion, or the other. So I, I, I do want to wish you all well, though. Um, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian. I really don't care who are you all. I really do love you all when, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so... Um, hope you love us too. And we want to just, am I getting along with here? But I'm just excited to be back. I'm excited you're back. And I'm really glad that John was in here today with us. Yep. Even no though I didn't say it. much. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> I just, thought, I really did think you were going to talk more today. But, you know, did you have, did you, did before, did, was there anything you want to talk about that we didn't talk about? No. No, you covered covered pretty much. You everything. want to talk about any tarpon fishing, nothing like that. I know you always no, like talking. You always like talking fishing, fishing with everybody. The spot sealers, we can't you know, feed them. 
Yeah, you want to talk about the chicken and the mullet got the same gizzard? Anything you know that you want to go? Well, what's over? that all about? Because you you said that on your list today. Tell me, elaborate on that. About the chicken and the mullet yeah, got the yeah, same yeah. gizzard. Tell me this. All right. So for freaking years before internet or anything, we would run around, not run around, but we would tell people that the chicken and the mullet got the same gizzard. Right. And for the longest time, people thought it was a joke. Well, now that we have Wikipedia, so this is like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, we were at a family function. My sister's marrying this uh, Canadian dude. Yeah, since he'd be a phenomenal guy. Lucky me. But anyway, <laughs> I tell him that the chicken and the mullet got the same Didn't gizzard. sound convincing. No, it, it, no, I'm <laughs> telling you, dude, when you, when you, you got a sister? I have four of them. Okay. It, 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 do any of them have a husband that you're not quite a fan of? They did. It's horrible. So I feel fortunate that I like this dude. Right? Okay. Right. Okay. So anyway, he's a tech freak, and we're at the dinner table. And Actually, I'm, I like all my brother-in-law's friends. You're lucky. The um, I'm telling the guy that the chicken and the mullet got the same gizzard, and he's like, you're so full of shit, and he Wikipedia's it, and he gets on, and he's like, the chicken and the mullet got very similar gizzards. That's it. Your ego is not your amigo, <laughs> right? Always remember to do your best and let God do the rest. I want to thank Jeff Maggio for coming on the show today. Real guy. Check him out. Lunker Dog. Real guy podcast. Uh, right? I want to remind you that anytime you're even remotely thinking about buying a vehicle, get in touch with Joey Accardi, Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Pompano Beach. Call my man Dean. He will hook you up. And I want to remind you that no matter where you are, no matter where... We all are. What we're doing, we're always connected by water. Thanks, John. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Run that dog, guys. Run that dog. Run that dog. <laughs> <laughs>